And so we return to discuss Nietzsche and his book, Beyond Good and Evil. I will be reading for you my English translation and commenting on the text from time to time. We left off with paragraph 56, which is as follows in my translation. Whoever, like myself, has long struggled out of some kind of mysterious desire to think deeply about pessimism and to free pessimism from its semi-Christian, semi-German narrowness and simplification, as displayed by the current century, namely in the Schopenhauerian philosophy, whoever has looked the most world-negating style of thinking up and down with an Asiatic and meta-Asiatic eye beyond good and evil and no longer as Buddha and Schopenhauer did under the spell and delusion of morality. Whoever has done so has inadvertently opened his or her eyes to the inverted ideal, the ideal of the most exuberant people, the ideal of the liveliest people, the ideal of the most world-affirming people, those who have not merely learned to resign themselves to and to put up with everything that is and was, but who want to have it all over again. From out of all eternity, insatiably summoning De Capo from the beginning, not merely to himself or herself, but rather to whole plays and spectacles, and not merely to spectacles, but fundamentally to those who have need of the spectacle and who the spectacle makes necessary because he or she will again and again have need of it and again and again be made necessary. How is that? And would this not be circulus, vicious, deus, the divine vicious circle is what that means. So Nietzsche is addressing the eternal recurrence of the same, the ewige Wiederkehr des Gleichen. Now, despite what other people might tell you, including Cambridge University Press, this is not the first published reference to the eternal recurrence of the same. Let me just get this out of the way. So Nietzsche has already written about this in um, paragraph 285 of The Gay Science in which he writes about um, die ewige Wiederkunft, die ewige Wiederkunft von Krieg und Frieden, the eternal return of war and peace. Also in paragraph 341 of the Gay Science, there is a story that Nietzsche tells us, a story, a hypothetical story, I suppose. You know, Nietzsche asks, I'm just paraphrasing and translating, what if a demon were to visit you at night in your most solitary solitude, in your loneliest loneliness, and say to you, you're going to have to live your life over again and again and again? Would you throw yourself to the ground and gnash your teeth and cry and tear your hair out? Or would you say, thank you, demon, let it come, let it come again and again and again, right? Oh, you God. Would you praise the demon as a god and say, yes, I want this to happen. So this is the eternal recurrence of the same, which is a thought experiment. I have to make that clear. It, he, Nietzsche is not describing temporality. He, this is not his theory of time, really. So the eternal recurrence of the same is essentially Nietzsche's categorical imperative. Imagine that your life were to repeat itself for all of eternity and let this thought guide your conduct. So act as if everything that you say and do were to replicate itself eternally without ceasing, without limit. Imagine that everything that you say and do were to recapitulate itself, were to repeat itself for all of eternity. So he's not saying that this is what time is, or this is how time works. Of course, time doesn't work, but you know, 
This is, this is not how time unfolds itself, right? No, not at all. Nietzsche is not saying that we're going to live forever. He's not repeating samsara, the Hindu doctrine of reincarnation, although he is reinterpreting it. He is, reappropriate, he is reappropriating it. He is revising it for his own purposes. He's saying, no, live your life. This is the only life you have. We are all mortal. We are all limited in space and in time. But why don't you live your life as if everything that you do will have been eternalized. Now, I've said this before, but Nietzsche did not believe in an infinite world. He believed that the world was finite, and there is a finite series of resources, a finite series of elements, right? But all of these finite series of elements are rearranged, will rearrange themselves in different permutations in each age. So there is a finite set of elements. There is one Plato, there is one Napoleon, right? Um, there is one Virgin Mary. There are a certain finite number of typologies, right? But all of these types, all of these typologies will be endlessly rearranged throughout time, right? So he's saying that this limited number of resources, this limited number of elements will transmute themselves in different permutations throughout time. So in that sense, it is a theory of history. But he's not saying that we are immortal. He's not saying that we will be reincarnated, you know, through parthenogenesis or something, right? Um, not parthenogenesis. Um, No, I'm sorry. Um, not through the not through the transmigration of souls. I just remembered the word I was looking for: metempsychosis, which is a term that Joyce uses in his Ulysses. No, parthenogenesis means the virgin birth. Sorry. No, metempsychosis um, is the transmigration of souls, the movement of one soul from one body to another, or samsara in Hinduism, which is you know, you're born as a human being in one life. But based on your actions, based on your behavior, you might be reincarnated as a fox again and again and again. And the end of that cycle in Hinduism is called Nirvana, which is not an overrated rock band in the 1990s. No, Nirvana is the snuffing out of the candle of life. And you want to reach Nirvana. You want your candle to be extinguished because, oh God, you know, do I have to come back as a flamingo? Do I have to come back as a toad yet again? I don't want to be reincarnated. I don't want to undergo the endless cycling and recycling of samsara. No, I want my candle to be extinguished. I want my candle to be snuffed out. And again, the snuffing out of the candle is called nirvana, the extinguishing of the candle of life. But uh, anyway, this is not really what Nietzsche means. Again, Nietzsche does not believe in reincarnation. The doctrine of the eternal recurrence of the same, die ewige Wiederkehr des Gleichen, is not the doctrine of reincarnation. What it is, is two things. Again, it is a thought experiment. Live your life in such a way that everything that you do will have been repeated eternally, endlessly, right? Pretend, imagine that everything that you do will replicate itself eternally. So in other words, live as if there is no present moment. The now in quotation marks is the past, which is recuperated as the future, right? So in other words, the future is perfect, if you get the joke. There is no present, there is only the future perfect. Prolepsis, right? So, so nothing is, everything will have been. It's not a question of what will happen, it's what will have happened, right? Because the past is recycled in the future. The pa and then the, the second um, connotation, the second dimension of the doctrine of the, of the eternal recurrence of the same is a theory of history or of historicity, really. And that is that every age has a fixed set of elements 
but these elements are rearranged into a series of permutations. So the same elements are transmuted in each epoch. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I'll return to this later at some point. So we continue now, paragraph 57. With the power of his mental gaze and insight grows the distance and at the same time the space around the human being. His or her world becomes deeper, forever new stars, forever new enigmas and, and images enter his or her vision. Perhaps everything on which the eye of his or her mind tested its incisiveness and profundity was nothing more than a practice opportunity, a playful matter, something for children and for child brains. Perhaps someday the solemnest concepts, such as God and sin, concepts that have caused so much fighting and suffering, will seem to us no more important than toys and childish whining seem to an seem important to an old man. Let me read that again. Perhaps someday the solemnest concepts, God and sin, concepts that have caused so much fighting and suffering will seem to us no more important than toys and childish whining seem important to an old man. And perhaps the old man in quotation marks will have need of another toy and another form of suffering, forever still child enough an eternal child, right? So, oh my goodness, there's a great deal going on. But to be brief, these are the three metamorphoses of the spirit, right, that Nietzsche elaborates on in um, Also Sprach Zarathustra. The first stage of the mind, right, the metamorphoses of the spirit, the transfigurations of the spirit, the transmogrifications of the mind, right? Um, first of all, one is a camel, and some people never transcend the stage of the camel. And the cameline stage is the stage at which one inherits and bears and defends, to an extent, concepts of tradition. So what you're taught at school, what your parents teach you, what religious leaders teach you, what spiritual leaders and mystics teach you, what political leaders teach you, all of, these, all of these ideals are absorbed, are assimilated on the stage of the camel. And then the second stage is the stage of the lion. So, and that's the stage of, of the Joker when Arthur Fleck turns into the Joker, right? And you start fighting against tra tradition. You start fighting against institutions like school and church. And you just start attacking and attacking and attacking. And this is what Nietzsche did for most of his period of lucidity, I'm sorry to say. He didn't live long enough to go to the third stage. If you accede to the third stage, the third stage is the stage of the child. And that's when you become forgiving and patient and obliging and accommodating. Not, not, not accommodating in the sense that you concede anything. You don't surrender, you don't sacrifice your position. What you do is you're just kind of indulgent um, because you understand people, you understand the mechanical way in which people act, and you understand that there is no such thing as free will, and, and people are mechanical in a sense. You know, they, they behave in a mechanical way, they do what they're trained to do, they do what they're taught to do, unless they evolve as the child has evolved. And I love this because notice how the first stage is not the stage of childhood, it's, it's the last stage of the human spirit, and that's the highest stage. It really is a Buddhistic stage. It's the stage of, of the highest universal consciousness, if we must use that term. Um, it's a stage of enlightenment, if you want. It's a state of wakefulness, of awakenedness, of alertness, of awareness, right? Um, Whereas the previous two stages really were the stage of benightedness, right? Of mental intellectual darkening. Um, but why am I bringing this up? Well, because if, if you are an old man in quotation marks, right? It doesn't mean you're physically old, but, or even chronologically old. It just means that the mature stage of human consciousness is the stage at which you look at everything with the eyes of a child. And there's no resentment in your heart. You know, I forgot to say this when we were when I was discussing the last paragraph. 
A person of resentment clings to the it was, in German, the es war. And what you have to do is you have to affirm the es war, the it was, you know, everything that happened in your past, everything ha that happened in history and say, no, I want it to happen again and again and again. So you want to celebrate and affirm everything that happened in the past by wanting it to happen again. Noch einmal, noch einmal. Happen again, happen again, happen again. Yet again, yet again, yet again. I want everything that ever happened to happen again for all of eternity. And that is the state of joyful knowledge. And that is the, the consciousness of a child, which is not naive. No, it's ironic. <laughs> this is a wonderful paradox because the child is really the wise one, right? And the ch again, the child is the final stage of human consciousness, the most evolved stage, the transcendent stage of human consciousness. It's not the initial beginning stage, the inaugural stage of, of, of human consciousness at all. So um, the terminal stage of human consciousness, of the human spirit, of the human intellect, the human mind, and I know all these things don't mean the same thing, but, but that is a stage at which the human being looks at the world, looks at oneself, looks at other human beings with innocence, with a knowing innocence, because that's a paradox, right? You're knowing yet unknowing at the same time. You know why people do what they do, and you just kind of smile, maybe smirk a little. There might be a little bit of smugness and self-complacency in that but you smile knowingly yet unknowingly. You're not bitter, you're not resentful. You're not the person of resentment, which we will talk about when we finally get to Nietzsche's next book toward the genealogy of mor morals, toward the genealogy of morals. Um, the man of resentment or the woman of resentment, the person of resentment is someone who, again, adheres to the past, the it was, and is very resentful because that person of resentment, he or she knows that the past is immovable and is not removable, right? You cannot alter the past. The past is irrevocable. Time is irreversible. You can't reverse the past. You can't change the past. You can't revoke the past. So a person of resentment is very bitter about that because he or she cannot change the past, but wants to change the past. You know, that's something that you'll see very wealthy people and very powerful people have all the money in the world, perhaps, and all the power in the world, but they don't have youth. They don't have possibility. Their possibilities have been sapped. Their possibilities have dried up, have been exhausted. So they look at the past sometimes with eyes of resentment, with eyes of bitterness, and they want to change the past, but they can't. And Nietzsche's way out of this difficulty is to say, no, say to the past, I'm glad that you happened. And if I could, I would replay the past eternally. I don't say infinitely because that word is often misused. Infinite means spaceless, right? And eternal means timeless. And sometimes these two concepts are confused, but I digress. Paragraph 58. Has anyone ever noticed how a genuinely religious life requires external leisure or semi-leisure? Well, that's the truth, isn't it? I mean, if, if someone truly believes in the immortal soul or the immortality of the soul and sin and redemption, why wouldn't you give up everything, everything worldly, right? And from morning until night, and maybe even throughout the night, uh, in an insomniacal days and haze, why wouldn't you pray and do nothing but pray? And why wouldn't you abstain from all worldly delights? Why wouldn't you devote yourself purely to the soul and to the health of the soul? Um, and isn't it the case that anyone who is truly religious, genuinely religious, really does require a great deal of leisure time? So if that's the case, doesn't religion depend on opportunity? Uh oh, and and if if the religiously ethical, right, the religiously ethical are the only truly moral people, then morality depends on opportunity. 
And what do you say to those who have no opportunity to be pious? What do you say to those who do not have the leisure time, perhaps because of poverty? What do you say to those who do not have the leisure time to be devout? Are they not good people? Are they not moral people? I mean, let me just continue. Leisure for its favorite pastime, microscopic self-examination, as much as for that tender state of composure known as prayer, and is a constant readiness for the, in quotes, coming of God. I mean, leisure with a good conscience from ancient times until today, from the bloodline, is not entirely foreign to the aristocratic feeling that defiles work, right? the kind of contempt for work that the wealthy have. That is to say, it is the feeling that work makes soul and body common. And has anyone ever noticed that consequently, the modern, noisy, time-devouring, self-complacent, stupidly arrogant sedulousness, stupidly arrogant sedulousness, more than anything else, educates and leads one to, in quotes, unfaith, among those who live outside of religion, for example, in Germany, I find free-thinking people of different stripes and heritages. The majority for whom diligence from generation to generation has deteriorated the religious instinct. So those who are busy have no time to be religious. Does that mean that they're immoral people because they have no time to be religious? Um, and is religion dying in the modern world? Well, it did. It did. I mean, everyone knows this, right? Modernity is not a religious period. It's not a, a period of pious devotion to the divine, to the supernatural. I mean, does anyone believe that? I mean, it's, it's almost a cliche at this point that in the modern world, divinity um, vanishes, right? I mean, I think everyone knows that. It's almost banal at this point to say that. Um, so much so that they no longer know what purpose religion serves, and they only register its presence in the world with a kind of stolid astonishment. Oh, you're religious? You're still religious after all this time? They feel that they are already industrious enough, these decent people, what with their businesses and their pleasures to say nothing of their, quote, fatherland, their newspapers, their familiar, excuse me, their familial duties. Notice how contemptuous Nietzsche is of the irreligious. He's not contemptuous of the religious in this passage so much as he is contemptuous of the irreligious or the non-religious. Very interesting. It seems that they have no time left over for religion, especially since they have no idea whether that religion would be a new business or a new pleasure, since, after all, they say to themselves, quote, it is impossible that anyone would go into a church just to spoil a good mood. <laughs> so the businessman or the businesswoman of modernity, the, the merchant of modernity, uh, looks at the religious flock, the congregation, on a Sunday morning and thinks to him or herself, why are all these people filing into the church? They're all funneling into the church. Why would they do that? Can you make money off of it? Why would they go there? I mean, surely it can't be just to bore themselves. There must be some advantage. What's the, what's the pleasure? What's the diversion? What's the distraction? Or again, how can I make money off of this? That's how they think. I don't think Nietzsche is wrong about this. I think that probably is how the industrious types think. You know? They are hardly enemies of religious custom, right? They're not enemies. If anyone, such as the state, requires of them to participate in such customs, they do what is required of them, as many people do. So if you want to become president of the United States, I'm thinking of two, two presidents right now. I won't name them, but if you want to become president of the United States, you have to have a church to go to. Isn't that interesting? In fact, I think to hold public office in the United States you need a church to go to. In fact, that's even, in many states, that's even sanctioned, sanctioned and mandated by law, by state law. 
so much for the Jeffersonian division between church and state, right? Yeah. They do so. They, they go to church. They observe religious pastimes, customs. They do so with a patient and modest earnestness and without much curiosity or discomfort. Yeah, okay, I'll say a prayer. I'll sing a hymn. Sure, if that's what I need to do to make my family happy or, you know, to hold public office. Sure. Yeah, I'll do it. Sure. They just live too far on the other side beyond religion to find a for or an against necessary in such matters. These are not the, the businessmen and the businesswomen, the business people, the industrious types. Um, they're not enemies of religion. They're not critics of religion, Nietzsche is saying. Today, uh, the majority of middle-class German Protestants belong to these indifferent ones, particularly those in the centers of trade and transportation. Doesn't this still hold? Isn't this still relevant? Like, don't you get this sense that many people go to church or perhaps also synagogue and temple, I don't know, um, for social reasons? You know, it, 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 going to church could be a form of networking. I mean, I've seen this. I've seen this. You know, I, I mean, I, I saw it when I was very young, but I, I do remember seeing that. The same is true of the majority of diligent scholars and the entirety of the university faculties, excepting the theologians whose existence and very possibility gives a psychologist more and more enigmas to unpuzzle. Rarely do pious and ecclesiastical people ever have an idea how much goodwill, one might even say, how much willful will is required for a German scholar to take the problem of religion seriously. His entire craft and the worker-like industriousness that his modern conscience or her modern conscience demands of him or her inclines him or her to a condescending, almost kindly cheerfulness toward religion, mingled with a gentle deprecation on account of the, in quotes, filthiness of the spirit, which he or she assumes is within every church in which people make their confessions. Yeah, this goes back to... Um, something that Nietzsche wrote in Also Sprach Zarathustra and, and also in um, The Gay Science. It's the idea that churches are places of shame. And it's a brilliant observation. Nietzsche talks about the architecture of the church and how there are all these alcoves and niches and hidden passageways and the, you know, and, and the, the cells, the confessional cells, right? the partitions of the confessional room, um, the sacristies, all of these scream of shame from Nietzsche. Is he wrong? Is he wrong about that? Only from a historical perspective, thus not on the basis of his personal experiences, does a scholar take religion into careful consideration with a reverential seriousness. But even when he or she raises his or her feeling for religion to gratitude, he or she does not come any closer to church or to piety. Perhaps quite the opposite, right? The pragmatic indifference for religious matters in which he or she was born and raised is sublimated to a carefulness and purity that avoids contact with religious people and, a re and religious affairs. So in other words, when he or she is not required to have truck with the religious, with the godly, with the pious, with the faithful, he or she avoids the religious as if they were a plague. That's what Nietzsche is suggesting in this passage. It can be the depth of his or her tolerance and humanity that brings him or her to evade the subtle crises that come from such tolerance. Each age has its own divine naivete of which other ages might be envious. And how much naivete, how much admirable, childish, and unrestrainedly stupid naivete 
lies in the scholar's feeling of superiority. I love this because he's not letting the scholars off the hook. He's not letting the irreligious off the hook. I've said this before. Let me say it once more. In this book, Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche lets no one off the hook. He doesn't let the intellectuals off the hook. He doesn't let himself off the hook. He doesn't let the free spirits off the hook. He doesn't let the determinists off the hook. And he doesn't even let the irreligious off the hook. He lets no one off the hook. In the good conscience of his tolerance, in the cluelessly simplistic surety with which his instinct deals with religious people as if they were an inferior and debased kind of people. Nietzsche doesn't think that. Over which he has grown out, away upward, he or she, the little presumptuous dwarf and mob man, the busy, nimble head worker and hand worker of ideas, of modern ideas, in quotation marks, of course, because Nietzsche has nothing but contempt for modern ideas. And I have to say, in this passage, have you noticed, Nietzsche evinces a greater contempt for modern ideas and for modernity than he does for religion and the religious. In fact, Nietzsche is quite indulgent, uh, indulgent and forgiving toward the religious. Um, he finds them charming, if anything. He finds them adorable. But he is mocking and mercilessly um, mocking of modern thinkers with their modern ideas and of, again, business people, trades people, the merchants, those who work in transportation. He's, he's unforgiving toward them. He's, he's harshly critical toward them. Paragraph 59. Whoever has looked deeply into the world can guess the wisdom that resides in the superficiality of human beings. <laughs> That's a paradox, right? It is their self-preservative instinct that teaches them to be elusive, light and false. Here and there, among artists and philosophers, there is discoverable a passionate and exaggerated worship of pure forms. Yeah, it's a reference, obviously, to Plato. Let no one doubt that whoever in such a manner needs the culture of the superficy once grabbed what was beneath the surface with unfortunate results. Perhaps there is even a hierarchy among such burnt children, these innate artists, who can only enjoy life by pretending, by intending to falsify its image, as if it were a protracted revenge against life. One can induce the degree to which they are sick of life from the extent to which they want to see its image falsified, diluted, D-I-L-U-T-E-D, pushed into the beyond, deified. One can count the omnes religiose as the highest rank of the artists. It is the deep, suspicious fear of an irremediable pessimism that drives whole millennia to sink their teeth into a religious interpretation of existence. It is the instinctive fear that suspects that the truth has been seized upon too soon before the human being has become strong enough, before the human being has become artist enough. Piety, the life in God, thus appears as the final spawn of the fear of truth, the most refined monster to have ever been spawned from the fear of truth. It appears as the worshipfulness of an artist, as an artist's drunkenness, before the most consistent of falsifications, the will to invert the truth into untruth at all costs. Perhaps there has never been a more powerful means of beauty, excuse me, perhaps there has never been a more pow power, uh, sorry, perhaps there has never been a more powerful means of beautifying humanity than piety. Through piety, humanity can become so much art, so much surface, so much color play, so much kindliness, so that no one suffers by looking at it anymore. Now, yes, okay, Nietzsche is being ironical here. I will allow that. But he also is being gently accommodating. He's, in, he's being indulgent and obliging. 
toward the religious. I do want to say one thing here that, and I, let me just say it. This passage is the reason that I decided to translate Jenseits von Gut und Böse into English. Now you might wonder why that is. What was it about this passage that prompted me to translate, to retranslate the entire book into English? It's been translated, I mean, at least, I, mean I, I don't even want to guess how many times. It's been translated many, many times before. Well, the reason is the Cambridge University Press translation of this book is an abomination. And the translation in particular of this passage is absolutely unintelligible and illegible. In fact, the translator for Cambridge University Press made this passage utterly muddy and muddled. He made it unreadable. He even made Nietzsche say the exact opposite of what Nietzsche actually said, what he actually wrote. Okay, I mean, I'm, if you don't believe me, I mean, I don't recommend it, but look at the Cambridge University Press misrendering of this passage, and I think you'll agree with me, especially if you measure it against the German. It's, it's utterly atrocious. And since this, Beyond Good and Evil is the first serious book that I ever read. I read it at the age of 14. In English, it's true. But this book incited me to learn German. And um, when I discovered this book in a library at the age of 14, um, I stopped reading Stephen King and Clive Barker. Um, and I started to read Nietzsche and um, James Joyce and Franz Kafka. I stopped listening to ACDC and other heavy metal and hard rock bands. And I started listening to the Talking Heads, whether or not this was a good thing or a bad thing, you know, in the Velvet Underground. Um, I, I stopped watching cheesy horror films and I became obsessed with German Expressionism. The cinema of German Expressionism, like Nosferatu, Metropolis, and the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And those are only the most famous ones but I, I became interested in German Expressionism and I started, I started to learn German very slowly. I didn't learn it formally until much later, but um, so I'm just saying, I feel as if I owed Nietzsche a debt of gratitude. And this is my way of repaying the debt that I owe to Nietzsche by translating this book and clarifying this book because it had been so badly translated into English by others. Paragraph 60. To love human beings for the sake of God, until this point, that was the strangest, most dignified feeling achieved by human beings. The love of humanity is a form of stupidity and animality more than anything else, without some kind of sacralizing hidden motive. The addiction to the love of humanity only gets its measure, its refinement, its grain of salt, its tincture of ambergris from a higher addiction. Whoever it was who first sensed and experienced, in quotation marks, this, even though his tongue might have stumbled as he tried to express it, let him be for all time as holy and as admirable as the one who has flown the highest and who has the most beautifully lost his or her way. Paragraph 61. The philosopher, as we free spirits understand him, or her, as the person who has the most expansive responsibility, as the person who has a conscience for the total development of the human species, this philosopher will make religion work for his or her own training and education. In the same way that previous political and economic conditions would serve his or her own interests. The influence that religion can exert on a philosopher's training and power of discrimination depends on the kind of person who is placed under religion's spell and shelter. The influence of religion might be as destructive as it is creative and formative. Notice how Nietzsche is quite, I mean, he's relatively positive toward religion in this passage. And no, he doesn't believe in religion. He's not recommending, not recommending that we be religious, but notice he, he actually 
ends this section, section three of Beyond Good and Evil, affirmatively toward religion. For the strong, independent, commanding, prepared, and predetermined philosophers, in whom the reason and the art of a reigning race is corporealized, religion can be a means of overcoming resistances in order to dominate. Religion as the bond that binds ruler and subordinate together. Religion as the bond that binds the conscience of the subordinate to the rule. The most concealed and intimate part of the submissive, that part which the submissive would like to withdraw from obedience, is revealed to the ruler and becomes answerable to the ruler thanks to religion. So doesn't religion give power a kind of theological backing? Doesn't religion give support to dictatorships? Um, this explains theocracy, you know. It was Henry VIII, wasn't it, who founded the Anglican Church, and he was revered as a god. So it wasn't enough that Henry VIII was the king of England. He also had to be the divine ruler of England. So he wasn't, wasn't literally the god of England, but he was the pope. In, in essence, he was the religious leader of England as well. Um, religion promotes obedience to a leader. And if the leader is a political leader, this is all that the political leader requires. The political leader demands submission, demands obeisance from his followers or her followers. And in the event that certain individuals from distinguished origins are inclined to a withdrawn and contemplative life by their lofty spirituality and only reserve for themselves the gentlest form of dominance over exceptional young men or monks, religion can also be used as a means of creating quietude, a quietude that is remote from the noise and the bustle of vulgar governance. So again, isn't isn't Nietzsche saying that religion is a way of spiritualizing the political? Religion as a spiritualization of the political, right? Religion can even be used to create a space of purity that is remote from the necessary filth of all politicking, right? Again, religion sublimates politics, right? But I would go further. I would say that the religious is the political, and the political is the religious, if you think about it. All religion is political insofar as it wants to institute itself, institutionalize itself, right? All religion wants domination and institutionalization. But it's also the case that all politics is, re all politics is religious, right? All politics is based on the worship of a ruler, of a leader. This is how the Brahmins understood religion, for example. With the assistance of a religious organization, the Brahmins, right, gave to themselves the power to appoint their kings to the people. Now, here Nietzsche is using the word das Volk, das Volk. While the Brahmins positioned themselves far away from the people and felt themselves to be human beings with loftier, meta-regal tasks. In the meantime, Religion also gives the ruled the portion of instruction and opportunity they need to someday rule and command themselves. That is the rising classes and stations in which, through fortunate marriage arrangements, the strength and the lust for willing, the will to self-mastery are forever ascending. To them, religion offers incentive and temptation enough to travel down the path of higher spirituality, to try out the affects with an A, of the great self-overcoming, the affects of silence and solitude. Ascetism, ascetism, um, A-S-C-E-T-I-S-M. So it's not um, aestheticism, right? Ascetism and puritanism are almost indispensable means of education and ennobling. Whenever a race wants to master its mob origins and to work its way up to eventual mastery, whenever a race wants to master its mob origins and to work its way up to eventual mastery. Lastly, as far as average people are concerned, the almost, those who are only there to serve, those who are only there for general utility, 
and who are only permitted to exist for these reasons, religion gives them an inestimable self of complacency with their situation and type. Um, that's mistranslated. I'm sorry, there was a mistake. I'm going to have to read it again. Lastly, as far as average people are concerned, the almost, not the almost, but the all dash most, those who are there only to serve, those who are only there for general utility, and who are only permitted to exist for these reasons, religion gives them an inestimable self-complacency with their situation and type. Religion gives them a multitudinous peacefulness of heart. Religion ennobles their obeisance. It gives them, and those who are like them, yet another kind of happiness and yet another kind of sorrow. Religion brings them something like a transfiguration and beautification, something like a justification for their everyday life and for their total degradation, for the total semi-bestial poverty of their souls. Religion and the religious signification of life smears sunshine over such always tormented human beings, over such always tormented human beings, and makes even their own image endurable to them. Religion has the same effect that the Epicurean philosophy has upon those suffering members of the higher classes. It refreshes, it refines, it exploits suffering, as it were. Ultimately, it is sanctifying and legitimizing. Now, this might surprise some people who see Nietzsche as purely anti-religious and purely irreligious. Isn't it interesting how this is, a, this is kind of an, an ironic relative defense of religion? But I, I have to stress, it is ironic and it is relative. Please, I hope no one thinks that this is a full-throated, unconditional apology for religion or defense of religion. I mean, someone like Jordan Peterson, if he ever were to read this passage and read beyond the first paragraph of Beyond Good and Evil, I think Jordan Peterson would probably distort the meaning of this passage. I have no doubt that he, he would if he hasn't already. Perhaps nothing is so honorable in Christendom and in Buddhism as their art of teaching, as their art of teaching even the most inferior types of people to use piety to install themselves within a higher illusional order of things and thus to make themselves content with the actual order in which they live hard enough and precisely this hard life is necessary. So Nietzsche is much closer, Nietzsche is much, Nietzsche is much closer to Hegel than he is usually made out to be. And this is a dialectical book. So now Nietzsche will polemicize against religion. I'm going to try to plow through this final passage. This is the final paragraph of section three of Beyond Good and Evil on the Religious Type. Paragraph 62. Finally, of course, in order to give a counter argument against religion, in order to show its terrible counterbalance and to shed light on its uncanny dangerousness. When religion is not put in the hands of the philosopher, who would use it as a means of training and of education, there is always a fearful and expensive price to pay. Religion sovereignly presides when it is left to its own devices and becomes its own goal and not one means among other means. As with any other animal species, humanity has a surplus of misbirths and invalids, the deformed and the fragile, the necessarily suffering. The best cases in humanity are always the exception, and when taking into consideration that the human being is the not yet established beast, the extreme exception. But it is even worse than that. The more a human being represents the higher type, the greater improbability that he will turn out well. The accidental, the law of nonsense in the total economy of humanity shows its destructive effect on the higher human being in the most terrifying manner. The life conditions of the higher human being are refined, multiple, and difficult to calculate. So how is this surfeit of failures treated by the two greatest religions? They seek to sustain, to stabilize in life, whatever can be preserved. 
Indeed, they are fundamentally on the side of the suffering, as the religion for the suffering. They give the suffering the right to suffer from life as if it were a sickness, and want to make every other sensation of life count as false and impossible. If anyone wants to value this preserving and sustaining solicitude, insofar as it was designed for the highest type of human being, the type that almost always suffers the most, in the total analysis, the sovereign religions belong to the chief causes of the degradation of the human, in quotes, type, to the lowest levels. They maintain too much of what should be, they maintain too much of what should be destroyed. They deserve inestimable gratitude, and who is too rich in gratitude not to become poor from thankfulness? For what, for example, the spiritual people of Christendom have done for Europe? Surely if they give the suffering consolation, if they give the oppressed and the insecure courage, if they give the dependent a stick to lean upon, if they entice the inwardly destroyed and primitivized to cloisters and to prisons of the soul, what else did they have to do but work on the sustenance of the sick and the suffering with good conscience? That means, in fact, and in truth, to work on the deterioration of the European race, to turn all valuations upside down. That is what they had to do, to shatter the strong, sick and great hopes, problematize pleasure and beauty, every form of self-mastery, everything virile, everything that conquers, every lust for mastery, every instinct that is owned by the highest and the well-formed type of human. They had to bend all of that, twisting it, all of it into insecurity, distress over one's conscience, self-destruction. Indeed, they perverted the entire love of the earthly and the mastery over the earth into hatred toward the earth and the earthly. That was the task of the church, and they had to set this task for itself until in its estimation, finally de-worlding, desensuousizing, and higher human being melted together into a single feeling. If someone could survey the amazingly painful, crude yet refined comedy of European Christendom with the mocking and detached eye of an Epicurean god, I believe that person would never stop laughing in astonishment. Does it not seem that a single will over Europe has dominated Europe for 18 centuries, making of the human being a sublime misbirth? Whoever has inverted needs, however, whoever is no longer Epicurean, but who has a divine hammer in hand, someone who comes across the near voluntary degeneracy and laming of Christian Europeans, Pascal, for instance, would he not scream with fury, with pity, with terror? Oh, you idiots, you arrogant, pitiful idiots. What have you done? Was that work for your hands? How you shattered and wrecked my loveliest stone? What did you get out of it? I would say Christendom was unto this point the most calamitous kind of self-elevation. People who are neither high nor hard enough to form human beings in the way that artists can. People who are neither strong nor far-seeing enough to preside with a sublime self-restraint over the foreground law of the thousandfold failures and destructions. People who are not distinguished enough to see the abyssal differences in rank, the cleft of rank between one human being and another. Such people have, with their equality before God, presided over the fate of Europe until finally a diminutive, almost ludicrous type was chastened into existence, a herd animal something good-natured, something sickly, something mediocre. Today's European. Oh, how I have been looking forward to this, this next section. The fourth section of the book entitled Aphorisms and Interludes. I've been looking forward to this for about six days now. And uh, here we are, aphorisms, my favorite. Many of these are misunderstood and misquoted. I think I'm going to be commenting quite a bit, but I will read each aphorism and then pause and in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, give my commentary. Paragraph 63. Whoever is a fundamental teacher takes things seriously only in relation to one's students, even oneself. 
So if you think about it, if you're a fundamental teacher, if you're a genuine teacher, why do you have subjective experiences? Why do you have life experiences? You experience in order to teach. You don't teach in order to experience. You experience in order to teach. You gather and reflect on your subjective experiences so that you have something to teach. And someone who does nothing but teach has nothing to teach, right? You do have to have subjective experiences in order to be a fundamental teacher, right? A genuine, now I wanna use the, the Nietzschean term, a fundamental teacher, right? George Bernard Shaw once said, and uh, teachers resent this, but George Bernard Shaw once said famously, those who cannot do teach, but you could invert that proposition. You could say, those who cannot teach do, right? <laughs> so that's the first aphorism, aphorism 63. Paragraph 64, knowledge for knowledge's sake. That is the last snare laid by morality. Thereby we are completely entangled in morality once more. Um, this is not the first time Nietzsche has written something like this. So if you read the fourth section of All Zosprach Tuster, which was actually published for a very small group of people, for Nietzsche's apostles, for Nietzsche's friends, it had a very, it had a very limited first publishing run. But in, in part four of All Zosprach Tuster, Nietzsche tells stories um, it's a narrative, it's a narrative. And one of the narratives is the narrative of the leech. And the leech is a scholar who makes holy his knowledge. So his scholarship becomes a form of religion. And Nietzsche has a series of characters in part four of Also Sprach Zarathustra, which is Nietzsche's only novel. It is a novel, I don't care what anyone says, it's a philosophical novel. And, and again, part four is, is a literary narrative. Yes, it's a novel of ideas, but it's still a novel. And it should be taught in literature departments as well as philosophy departments, which, as I've said before, also Sprach Zarathustra is almost never taught in, in departments of philosophy, even though it's Nietzsche's greatest book, but okay. Um, but anyway, many of the characters in part four um, are humanists, right? And these are, people who think they're so enlightened, they think they're beyond religion, we've heard about them before, right? And yet they do nothing but repeat religion, right? They worship a donkey at the end, uh, spoiler alert, they worship a donkey at the end of part four of also Sprach Zarathustra, and the donkey is like their god. So they've made scholarship, enlightenment, uh, culture their god they deify scholarship, education. And so, um, yeah. Paragraph 65, the charm of knowledge would be small if less shame had to be overcome on the way to it. The shame is the shame of not knowing, of ignorance, right? Um, Anyone who has learned a foreign language knows about this. When you start, you're very halting and stuttering and you make mistakes. And it's very alienating because you have to really lose yourself in order to master a foreign language. You have to lose yourself in order to master a foreign language. And that's a very, that's an experience of self-estrangement, of self-alienation. But what I'm trying to say though is that there's a great deal of shame at first, usually. Um, but then, once you master a foreign language, as I've mastered German, it took me a long time, but I did it, um, there's a kind of pleasure that comes from knowing German. I mean, I, I get so much pleasure from talking in German to native speakers of German. And they usually say to me, you know, Joseph, your German is perfect. Uh, or almost perfect. And uh, I've been told a few times that I sound Danish, which I don't really see as, a, as an insult. And they didn't mean it as an insult, because of course, 
that's a Germanic language too, right? But um, they say I have a Danish accent. <laughs> that's, that's okay. I lie, they take that as a huge compliment. There's a kind of charm, I, I hope at least, when, it, when, when you have an accent sometimes. Anyway. Um, 65A. By the way, Nietzsche wrote these outdoors. He would go for long walks with a notebook and he would jot down his thoughts. His best thoughts came to him when he was walking, you know. My best thoughts come to me late at night. In the hypnagogic state, you know, the hypnagogic state is when you transfer from wakefulness to, to sleep. One is most dishonorable toward one's God. He is not permitted to sin. 66, the tendency of someone who lets oneself be debased, robbed, lied to, and exploited might be the shame of a God among men. So here we have yet again the light motif of the book. Profundity needs a disguise. All depth requires a mask, a camouflage, a simulation of some kind, some kind of some kind of dissimulation, really, right? And um, everything profound needs to disguise itself by way of the opposite appearance. So profundity disguises itself as shallowness. Because if profundity were to show itself as itself, it would be vulgarized, it would be debased, it would become common, right? As Nietzsche told us before, Common good is antiphrasis. He didn't use the term antiphrasis, but that's what he meant, right? There can be no common good because what is good is rare, right? 67, love for only one person is a kind of barbarity, for it is exercised at the expense of all other people. This also includes the love for God. I mean, you have 7.8 billion people on the planet Earth, and you're in love with one of them. And you tell yourself, this person is the only person for me. This person is the person I was made to love. I was created for this person. Um, I am obsessed with this person because love is a form of obsession. It's also a form of psychosis. You know, Kafka put it best, I think, when he said that love is the passage from this woman to the woman or this man to the man. It's the passage from the uh, indefinite article to the definite article, right? Because when you're in love, you singularize and isolate and particularize one human being out of currently 7.8 billion people. But what is that if not madness? Is that not madness? I'm going to be writing about this when I finally get around to writing about um, Antony and Cleopatra by Shakespeare. Maybe I'll create a video um, about it too. But if you think about it, that of all the people you can fall in love with, you fall in love with one person and you think that only this person is worthy of your love. Again, what is that if not madness? right? At the very least, would you not agree that it is a form of fascination or obsession? Surely it is. Surely it is. Paragraph 68. I did that, says my memory. I could not have done that, says my pride, and remains inexorable. Eventually, memory gives in. So in other words, um, this goes back to the eternal recurrence of the same, doesn't it? So we do something bad in the past, and we don't want to admit it to ourselves. We feel ashamed. Now, and forget about other people, although that, that could come into play, obviously. But you do something bad in the past, and you look back on that with shame. And there are, is like an angel and a devil in your mind. And on the one hand, your pride says... No, I did not do that. I did not do that. I did not, as a film. Um, your memory says, no, you did. You did that. And guess what? Your memory surrenders. Your memory is defeated. Your memory gives up and gives in. 
And pride is victorious. Pride wins out. So in other words, from, from now on, your mind will tell itself, I did not do that. I did not do the bad thing that I did. Again, I know I'm sounding like that, that famous film, which I won't quote directly. <laughs> um, one has not observed, this is, I'm sorry, this is uh, 69. One has not observed life very carefully if one has failed to see the hand that gently kills. So is it not possible to kill with politeness? I mean, that's what Nietzsche is suggesting here. So if you're a writer and you send in a manuscript to a publishing house and you get back a form letter, a boilerplate letter that says, every month we receive thousands and thousands of manuscripts. Unfortunately, your manuscript was not one that we will consider at this time. However, we will put your manuscript on file should an opportunity arise. So, so that's politeness, a few more examples. So um, someone, um, asks another person out on a date, and the person who is asked out says, unfortunately, I am not available for dating right now, but thank you for your expression of interest. I will keep that on file, <laughs> or, or I, will, um, I will make your text message available to my Instagram followers or something. Um, if you go to Chick-fil-A and the clerk says, my pleasure, in response to your thank you, or if you go to Disney World or Disneyland, maybe both places, and one of the Disney employees says to you, have a Disney day. Um, all of these are examples, I think, of malicious politeness. Zizek, whom I have problems with, but you know, he's, he's, he's actually quite brilliant at times. I, I have some criticisms, but no, he could be, he could be quite brilliant. But Zizek, in his book, In Defense of Lost Causes, calls this the unmistakable dimension of humiliating brutality. <laughs> so the unmistakable dimension of humiliating brutality that is inherent to polite formulae, polite responses. So, so politeness is ambiguous because on the one hand, it seems to evince a kind of concern for a person's sensitivity. It, it, you know, it's as if one is being polite to protect the other person's feelings, but beneath that, there's a kind of insensitivity, there's a kind of rudeness or even malice, a kind of brutal disregard for a person's feelings. So respectfulness and politeness are often enough screens, right, behind which disrespectfulness and insensitivity lurk. Um, there's such a thing as being aggressively polite, in other words, or or being politely aggressive, that's, that's what Nietzsche means. You know, there's the hand that gently kills. And if, if someone hasn't noticed that, then one has not observed life with a great deal of care, right? Paragraph 70, if someone has character, this means that one has a typical experience that repeats itself over and over again. Now, honestly, this sounds like Aristotle to me. Um, we are what we do, as, it, as you might paraphrase Aristotle, the Nicomachean Ethics. But if you read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, you know that, that Aristotle believed that ethics comes from character. If you're an ethical person, that means you have an ethical character. I believe that. I believe that. But where does character come from? Well, character comes from habit. And habit comes from doing the same thing over and over again. Now, if we're talking about virtue, let's move in the opposite direction. So you do the right thing, something virtuous, again and again and again. That creates a habit, right? And the habit creates a good character. That's Aristotelian ethics. And, and I mean, this sound, I mean, it's true that Nietzsche doesn't use the word ethics or ethical here. The atic. He doesn't use that that word, or atish, as the adjective. But um, this is basically Aristotle, right? It's basically Aristotle. Seventy-one. The sage as astronomer. So long as you feel the stars as something above you, 
you lack the eyes of a person of knowledge. Again, this goes back to Copernicus and Galileo after him. The idea that the universe is infinite and as we know is infinitely expanding outward, right? And if we live in an infinite space, there is no above and no below. The heavens are not above us, right? The heavens, where the heavens are depends on your perspective, depends in your perspective, depends on your situatedness, right? So um, there is no up, there is no down, there is no above, there is no below. If there is an infinitude of space, right? 